Well, good morning, Walden Church. Good morning, Texas. Welcome to another Sunday sermon. Today we are still going through the book of Matthew, and we are at Matthew chapter 19. And of course, you're always welcome to read along in our study. But right at the top of the page, uh, you'll probably see that it is a teaching from Jesus on divorce. So let's skip that one, right? I mean, that's a, that's a nerve that hits too close to home, and it's going to bring up all kinds of subjects like marriage and God's design for sexuality. And those are just subjects that really the church should not be talking about because the Bible is really out of touch on these topics. I mean, it's probably best to just skip it, right? I mean, who hasn't had a divorce somewhere in their family? Their parents' marriage or one of their brothers and sisters or maybe even their kids, right? I mean, it's too close to home, too, too painful. It hurts. Or, or maybe you're watching this and you're thinking, well, I've been married 35, 40, 50 years. We ain't getting divorced, so this doesn't apply to me. Or maybe you're thinking, I'm not even married, so... This doesn't apply to me. It's just best to skip it, right? We should just take a vote and just say, who wants to skip it? We can't read the Bible like that, can we? Skip the parts that make us uncomfortable or worse, rewrite the parts that make us feel uncomfortable. Because if anything is true, I need to highlight the parts of the Bible that make me uncomfortable and perhaps even alter my life drastically to obey those uncomfortable teachings. Today we're going to cover a lot of Jesus' uncomfortable passages. So just be prepared to be squirming in your seats. I said the topic of divorce had probably touched a lot of people. Uh, among 18 years, uh, people or older, right, in America, whether they've been married or not, 25% have gone through some sort of marital split. And as a result of COVID and the pandemic and the lockdowns over the United States, we could be looking at one of the single greatest years in divorce statistics. So here's what we know so far. Relationships that are already experiencing stress, they are probably at their breaking point because of these past couple of years. The financial strain, the polarizing political message that we've been preaching hasn't really helped either. And right now, studies say that once every 42 seconds, a marriage in America ends. That's 86 divorces per hour, 2,000 divorces a day, 14,000 divorces a week, 746,971 divorces a year. That means just in a few minutes that it takes for a man and a woman just to recite their wedding vows, three other couples have ended their marriage in divorce. While you and your spouse snuggle up to watch a romantic movie, 172 couples are getting divorced. The average first marriage ends in divorce after about eight years. So no, we're not gonna skip it. Matthew 19 verse one, now when Jesus had finished these sayings, he went away from Galilee and entered the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. And large crowds followed him, and he healed them there. And Pharisees came up to him and tested him, asking, Is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? He answered, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And said, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate." They said to him, Why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and to send her away? He said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. The disciples said to him, If such is the case of a man and his wife, it is better not to marry. But he said to them, not everyone can receive these sayings, but only those to whom it is given. For there are eunuchs who have been so from birth, and there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by men, and there are eunuchs who have been made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Let the one who is able to receive this, receive this. 
Now, I to I've told you a couple uh, times in a few of these lessons that Matthew doesn't always put things in chronological order. Sometimes he groups things together so they fit a theme or so they make sense. Last week, we looked at how Jesus handled conflict resolution. And it started with a question, who is the greatest? And Jesus said, it's not about greatest. It's about pursuing humility. So if we all adopt an attitude of humility, then we will care about the greatness of others. And as such, we will be more apt to forgive one another. Now, Matthew shows us a new question. Hey, Jesus, what excuse can we use to divorce our wives? What reason is a good reason? Moses said well, that we could divorce our wife if she offends us. What do you say? I think it's good that these two chapters are back to back because we could literally use the conflict resolution outline that Jesus gave us to help us repair our marriages, right? Because what was rule number one? If your spouse hurts your feelings or offends you or if there's some issue, go to them privately, right? Go to them privately. So many spouses have an issue or a grievance and what do they do? They tell their friends, right? She doesn't do this. He always does this. She makes me feel like this. Or they go to their kids, right? They tell their kids. We do it for sympathy. We do it so that we feel like we have people on our side. But it backfires. It only puffs you up and it makes the other person look like the bad guy. The person that you swore an oath to before God. What a horrible way to treat your spouse. Jesus says, if you have an issue, go to them privately and work it out. And if they don't listen, if their behavior doesn't change, then you stage an intervention and you bring a few friends. Now, let me ask you a question. If your husband needs to be confronted, whose friends would be better to confront him with? Your friends or his friends? Whose friends are gonna hold him accountable? His. How many marriages would be saved if more men would hold other men accountable, get their hands dirty, and care about the marriages of their friends? But what if your spouse still won't change? Well, then rule three is tell it to the church. No, wrong, horrible. No, this is where the Bible's wrong. No, we take it to the courts and we get the lawyers involved. Really? I mean, can I ask you something? Where did you get married? Where did you get married? What building were you in? In fact, when you, when you took that oath to your spouse, who were you standing in front of? Were you standing in front of a judge or a priest? Were you married in a church or were you married in a courtroom? Why do marriages begin with God and they end with the state? I, I'm only speaking to Christians right now, but why do we allow this? Really, why do we allow this? Why do we allow the state to dictate what makes or breaks a marriage? The church has sat back idly for far too long and been way too silent, and we have given judges and lawyers too much control over the fate of marriage. Here's what Paul says about going to court. When one of you has a grievance against another, does he dare go to law before the unrighteous instead of the saints? Or do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to try trivial cases? Do you not know that we are to judge angels? How much more than matters pertaining to this life? So if you have such cases, why do you lay them before those who have no standing in the church? I say this to your shame. Can it be that there is no one among you wise enough to settle dispute between the brothers, but brother goes to law against brother and that before unbelievers? To have a lawsuit at all with one another is already a defeat for you. Why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? But you yourselves wrong and defraud, even your own brothers. We get married in a church, we make an oath under God, and we get divorced in court. That makes no sense. Jesus says, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? 
and said, therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, whatever God has joined together, let not man separate. Who made them male and female? God. Who authored marriage? God. So who defines marriage? Who writes the rules of marriage? Who defines sexuality? God. Jesus is quoting Genesis, the very first pages of the Bible. Therefore, a man shall leave father and mother, hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Now, I know a lot of preachers might be fearful to tread here, but I don't feel any guilt because I haven't given you any of my own opinion. I'm not spouting my own opinion here. I'm just reading what this says. These are God's words. These are Jesus's words. They're not mine. Jesus lived in a very male-dominated patriarch world back then. Men ruled the household. Men ruled the world. And wives were only a little step above children. Women were not even allowed to testify in court. The religious leaders were allowing divorce on any grounds, simply because the man wanted to toss a woman aside. Which, if she didn't have any living family back then, no support system, that would have been a death sentence for her, or slavery, or prostitution. And Jesus steps in and he quotes Genesis, creation language, and he says, God made you male and female. He made the institution of marriage so that we would live together as co-equals. And you made a vow to him. You made a vow to her. So you keep your vow unless, Jesus says, there is infidelity. In fact, when Jesus teaches, he sometimes refers to himself as the groom and the church, his bride, a male and female relationship. And Jesus, in his own teachings, says that he loves his bride. Ephesians 5 says, Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. His body and is himself its savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. Husbands, men, this is the standard. This is our code of conduct. It's a very tricky thing being the husband. It really is. Yes, the Bible says the man is the head of the household. Yes, the Bible says the buck stops with him. It also says wives should submit in everything to their husbands. But... Paul does say here that even though it's a submissive role that the wife takes on, she only takes the submissive role with a husband who what? Loves her. Loves her the way Jesus loved the church. Don't miss that. Jesus spent his entire life living for, building up, and even dying for the church. The institution of marriage is a symbol of Jesus' love for us. Christ is faithful to us. Husbands are faithful to their bride. God designed marriage to be a mirrored reflection of his love for us. And so if we declare his love to the world, then we should put that love on display with our marriages. We should be displaying healthy marriages to the world. Your healthy marriage can be the best witness to the outside world. Look at the next passage, verse 13. Then children were brought to him that he might lay his hands on them and pray. The disciples rebuked the people. But Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them. For to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on them and went away. Now at first, this little story seems like a, a weird bridge between the topic of divorce and the story of the rich young ruler that is going to follow. But let's think of it more as an intro to the teaching. The same way Jesus used the example of the child in the previous chapter. We said last week we should be humble. A child knows their place. Back then, children were servants. Children were seen, not heard. They were workers who served their family. They were not proud. 
and the disciples want to send the children away because to them, children are not worthy. Children are not great. But Jesus says they are. You see, Jesus places value on things the world says are value less. Who is important to Jesus? Psh, not children. Jesus says wrong. In fact, you should try to be more like them. Well, not women. And Jesus says wrong. You need to honor them the way I honor you. Who is important? Jesus. Certainly the rich, right? It must be the rich. Doesn't God bless those who are righteous with wealth? I don't know. What do you think Jesus is going to say? Verse 16 says, And behold, a man came up to him, saying, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And he said to him, Why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. If you would enter life, keep the commandments. He said to him, Which ones? And Jesus said, You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, All these I have kept. What do I still lack? Jesus said to him, If you would be perfect, go sell what you possess and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished, saying, Well, who can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Then Peter said in reply, See, we have left everything and followed you. What then will we have? Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, in this new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you, who have followed me, will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands, for my name's sake, will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. You know, I had some statistics earlier about divorce. So it seems only apt that we should have some statistics about wealth. Because you, you would say that we live in a wealthy nation, right? In the United States of America, we live in a very wealthy nation. North America has 32% of the world's wealth. 32%. That, that's the biggest slice of the pie. So before we break the numbers down, before we get even smaller, just know that when all the nations sit down to eat at the table, America's plate has 32% of the food. In 2018, U.S. households held over $113 trillion in assets. I mean, for context, that is over five times as much as the goods and services produced by the U.S. economy in a single year. If that amount were divided evenly across the U.S. and given to every person of 329 million, it would result in over $343,000 for every person. That means for a family of three, that's over a million dollars in assets. But it's not all yours, is it? No. In America, the 400 richest families own more wealth than all the rest of us combined. For all Americans, the average net worth is 746,820. But that's skewed by that select group of very wealthy individuals. So the median net worth for all Americans is $121,000. The median worldwide income is less than $2,000 a year. That means half the households in America make more than 30 times the worldwide income. Now, I know you don't think that you live in luxury, but I'm sure you don't think that having a working toilet 
means you live in luxury. But in a lot of poor countries, millions upon millions of people do not have access to a good working toilet that is shared by a village, let alone have a working one in their home. I have three in my house. When comparing yourself to others, especially in such a rich nation like America, it might be tough not to feel like you're ahead of everybody else. But when you stack yourself against the rest of the world, things look significantly better for you. Even the bottom 10% of households in America who make only $14,000 a year, that's still seven times the global income. That is the equivalent of someone making $450,000 a year in America. It's hard to get down on yourself knowing that you're so well off compared to the average person around the globe. That makes this passage that Jesus teaches to the rich young ruler very uncomfortable for you and me. So what is Jesus saying? Well, first, salvation is a call to lose your life. Salvation is a call to lose your life. And this is foundational teaching. This is foundational to being a Christian. But what does that have to do with my wealth? Well, everything. Jesus asked this man to let go of everything that is precious to him and calls him to follow him. Remember, our answer from Jesus begins with a question. And it's a question about salvation. And Jesus answers with, be willing to let it all go. And the Bible says the man heard this and he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. In other words, he has a tough choice ahead of him. Salvation and heaven and eternity with Christ or my earthly possessions. Good teacher, what must I do? Jesus says, obey the Ten Commandments. The young man says, I follow all the easy ones. <laughs> Jesus says, what about the first one? I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before me. Money, wealth, possessions, they became an idol, didn't they? But before you get too worried, let me give you some reassurances. This is not a command, right? This is not a command to sell all your possessions and give them to the poor. Just because Jesus said it to this man doesn't mean that it's a command for you. Joanna was a wealthy woman in the Bible. She used her wealth to support Jesus and the disciples, and Jesus never asked her to give up her wealth. Wealth is not bad. Money is not bad. What does the Bible say? It says the desire for possessions are deadly. 1 Timothy 6.10 says, for the love of money is the root of all evil. Not money, the desire. Clearly the rich young ruler loved his wealth more than God. So just because Jesus asked the rich man to do this doesn't mean he would ask you to do it. But it doesn't mean that Jesus couldn't ask any of us to do it. Yes, wealth is a blessing. But in the case of this young man's life, it was deadly. Proverbs 15 says, Better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble with it. Matthew 6 says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Luke 12, Jesus says, take care and be on your guard against all covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. We have to understand that yes, wealth is a blessing. So then, because it is a blessing, we use it as God wills it. For the rich young ruler, it became an idol. It was an idol for this man, and Jesus said, get rid of it. He said, run from it. Last week's sermon, remember, Jesus said, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Yeah, but if I sell my treasure, then what will I be left with? Jesus says, the real treasure is me right? The real treasure is Christ. Jesus says, if you would be perfect, go sell what you possess and give it to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. You've heard the old saying, 
You can't take it with you. It's true. Your wealth can do more for the world when you allow God to use you. Don't miss the reward of Christ just because you want more stuff. And Jesus ends with, but many who are first will be last and the last first. What does that mean? Well, it's another false assumption, right? Who is the greatest? Who is the most powerful? Who is first? And Jesus says, it's not who you think. Which leads to the next story in Matthew 20. For the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. And after agreeing with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them to work in his vineyard. And going out about the third hour, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And he said to them, you go into the vineyard too, and whatever is right, I will give you. So they went. Going out again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour, he did the same. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing. And he said to them, why do you stand here idle all day? They said to him, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you go into the vineyard too. And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last up to the first. And when those hired about the eleventh hour came, each of them received a denarius. Now when those hired first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received a denarius. And on receiving it, they grumbled at the master of the house, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree for me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to the last worker as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with the kingdom and what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? And Jesus ends how he started. So the last will be first and the first last. Tell me something. According to this parable, who is the greatest? Who is the greatest in God's economy? How are people treated in God's world? How is wealth used by the wealthy in this story? Is this a story about people who get what they deserve? No. The first workers hired said, this isn't fair. And they're right. God's grace is not fair. Tell me something. Do you want God to treat you fairly? Do you want to immediately get what you deserve? I don't. I'm glad God is generous. I'm glad he is a merciful landowner because he owes me nothing. And right now he gives me everything. In this world, see, I am his. And he created all things. He created marriage. He created money. He created children. He created men. He created women. All of it. And I thank him for it because I am a lazy, disobedient rebel in this world. In fact, I'm always trying to push my own agenda. I'm always trying to make the world about me. I'm always trying to get everyone else to be like me, think like me, act like me, believe what I believe because I know best. And I'm always breaking the rules that God laid down. God made me in his image. And now I'm going to return the favor and continue to make the world in mine. Do I want God to treat me as I deserve? No way. He owes me nothing. And he gives me everything. And the next passage illustrates this. Verse 17 says, And as Jesus was going up to Jerusalem, he took the twelve disciples aside, and on the way he said to them, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and scribes, and they will condemn him to death, and deliver him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified, and he will be raised on the third day. That is the mercy of God. That, that, that God ordained the murder of his Son for you. I 
And we stand there with our arms crossed. And we say, I don't like God's views on marriage. I don't like God's views on sexuality. I don't agree. Why does God want me to be like a child? I don't want to be humble. I don't want to obey. I don't want to serve. I am the alpha. I am a self-made person. I don't want to be like a child. I want, I want other people to be more like me. Think what I think. Believe what I believe. I carve my own path. This is my money, my possessions, my wealth. I spend it how I want. It's rebellion. It's rebellion. When God rewards me with a day's wages, even when I have only worked for one hour in the field, When God rewards me with the grace of the cross and the gift of his own flesh and blood for my sake, how can I make any demands of God? God designed marriage. I don't get to tell him what it should look like. I don't get to cry unfair. I don't get to twist it into what I want. God gave us the model of the family unit, of procreation, of children and parents. So I don't get to tell him that I'm all grown up now. I don't get to tell him that I'm more woke than previous generations. I don't get to say I'm not going to obey or that I don't have to listen. God gave us the harvest, the rain. He gave me all the gifts that I have, all my talents, and all my treasure is from him. So I don't, I don't get to hoard it selfishly and then dictate to him how I spend it. It's rebellion. It's all rebellion. God isn't outdated. God isn't irrelevant. God is generous. Two main groups in this parable, those hired first and those hired last. The ones hired last made 12 times what they should have been given. Why did the landowner do this? Do we think the work would not have been done had he not hired them? I think it would have. I think the landowner simply hired them because he knew they needed the money. A chapter earlier, the disciples wanted to know who was the greatest. And they were shooing away kids. The Pharisees were trying to make the role of their wives even less by stripping away the rights of women even more. And Jesus said, the first will be last and the last will be first. Who is the greatest in my kingdom? Those who put themselves last. Those who serve everyone at the table first and serve themselves last. The landowner paid the workers in reverse order, and those who came last were paid first. In this way, the early workers saw how generous their employer was to their fellow workers who did not even have a contract. And when the late workers received a denarius, they happily thought they would receive more because they started work earlier. But as each group was paid, these men saw their expectations decreasing until it was their turn in line, and then they each received a day's wages. Of course, the workers complained, but they had nothing to complain about because that's the price they agreed on at the beginning. But there was a group that did not complain, those who had only worked an hour because they started the day hungry and now they had a whole day's wages. They didn't think about the unfairness on the part of the landowner. Instead, they considered him generous. How do you think they felt? Grateful. That's how we should feel. Do you? The prodigal son returned home. How do you think he felt? Grateful. 
He said he was willing to work for his father, even as a hired servant. We serve our father today because we are grateful for what he has done. We serve because we have experienced his love and his goodness. Paul says in 2 Corinthians, for the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. Martin Luther said blessings that come to us at times can be through our works and at times without our works, but never because of our works. God always gives them freely because of his great mercy. God, great gifts and blessings are given, not because you have earned it, but simply because he is gracious. If you can truly understand the grace of God in your life, then you will live for him. The rich young man says, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? And he didn't like Jesus' answer because his question was flawed. What good thing must you do? Costs you nothing. Costs Jesus everything. We have eternal life and his blessings today because God has chosen to offer them to us by his grace. Friends, this is what you need to do to have eternal life. Put your trust in Jesus. He died for your sin. He died for mine. He died so that you would be saved from being condemned. No, the only thing you have to do is receive Jesus as your personal Savior today. Today. Receive the gift of eternal life because it is a gift from God. Pray together with me. Dear God, thank you for sending your son Jesus so that I could be your friend. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for being with me all my life, even when I didn't know it. And I realize I need a savior to set me free from sin, from myself, and from all the habits and hurts and hangups that mess up my life. I ask you to forgive me of my sin. I wanna repent and live the way you created me to live. Be the Lord of my life and save me with your grace. I wanna to learn to love you and trust you and become what you made me to be. Thank you for creating me and choosing me to be a part of your family. Amen. When we get to heaven, there will be no contest for who is the greatest, the most deserving of God's grace, because none of us will have deserved it. All of us are sinners, and we are all saved by God's grace. No, there will only be one contest in heaven when we recall how unworthy we were and seeing Jesus, our Lord and King, standing there, the only contest will be who sings the loudest. I hope you've enjoyed this time uh, together with us, and I would encourage you to come to church. It doesn't have to be our church. It can be any church. Belong to a community. Get out there and be involved in a community. A community church is a place where you can serve the kingdom of God and where you can grow that church by using your talents and your gifts. Now we have two services on Sunday, one at 9.30. It's a traditional service and we have a choir and we're gonna sing all of your favorite hymns. We then have coffee and donuts in between. That's a great time to get to know some of the other people in the church and in the community. And then at 11 o'clock, we have our second service and that's a more contemporary service. We have a worship team, and you can come relaxed, come in jeans, come however you like. We also have a full children's program at that hour from preschool all the way through high school. And every Wednesday, we have youth group. So our youth group meets at our church every Wednesday at 6. Now, it doesn't matter if you attend our church or not. We would love to have your children come. Uh, we can take kids from 6th grade all the way through high school. We're going to feed them dinner and we'll send them home to you in about an hour and a half. Send them over on their skateboard or their bike, or they can walk over. We're really probably, what, 10 minutes from you? So yeah, 
We'd love to have your kids. Thanks for watching. Thanks for being a part of this, and I'll see you next week. Bye.